Um, so I love talking complexity. I've been doing that for 10 years, so I probably talk way too much. <laughs> Emma's brief said, don't do that. She said, focus on one project, one where you, you actually apply that whole thing. Make it as concrete as possible. So that's what I'm going to do today. Um, I will give you an, uh, an example of a project I did, uh, sponsored by Next Generation Infrastructures. They're sponsoring, so I've got to mention them, um, where we uh, evaluated public policies with regards to public-private partnerships uh, when it comes to um, uh, infrastructure projects. So it is a very concrete example. I'll start with that. I probably may sneak in some uh, more conceptual stuff later on. Uh, there's at least one slide that I inserted without any plan, so let's see what happens there. But I'll start very, uh, with this very concrete example, okay? So, uh, where does it start? It starts with um, mega projects. Mega projects, for those who are familiar with, uh, um, are projects that cost uh, a billion or more. There, it's a very loose definition, but you know the, the, you know the ones. Very expensive, uh, prestigious, and above all, um, way too expensive, budget overruns, time delays, you know, delivered five, ten years after the actual deadline, you know the ones, right? Um, so we have these, and I put up a few of them. They are, I've, uh, I've taken them from uh, the book by Ben Flubiak, uh, he wrote in 2002, on mega projects. He was pro probably the first to launch that actual term. <coughs> And so what you see here, um, the uh, Great Belt Link, the Eurosund, the Eurotunnel, and I put up a fourth picture by myself because I simply wanted to have four pictures. Um, so he says these are, these are similar or almost same projects. They are infrastructure projects. They aim to connect certain parts, right? That's what infrastructure does. And um, in a somewhat innovative way. So the Great Belt Link and the Eurosund Bridge are innovative in the sense that no one ever built bridges on that scale. The Eurotunnel is, um, is innovative because uh, the, the, no one had ever done that kind of thing. No one ever actually drilled a tunnel underneath uh, in, in such weak so, uh, uh, ground conditions underneath the sea. So we have these projects. We have these projects. They do the same thing. They've been built with the same idea in mind. They um, also run into the same problems, which is they were delivered years too late. They were twice as expensive as originally emphasized. So why, why do we do that? How, do, how did we get in that, that situation? Now, Flubiak and his colleagues looked into that and he said, well, if I look at these mega projects, um, you know, it happens to about, I, I don't know, remember the, the exact number, this is 80 or 85 percent of the projects in the world run into these tr uh, problems. So we have similar projects, similar outcomes, right? We lump them together, we look at what happened and we're done. Well, not that easy. So if you look in, in, into the nitty gritty details of this project, you will see that the reasons for the budget overruns and, and all that are very different. When it comes to the Great Belt Link, it was uh, environmentalist, or environmental concerns, I should say, <laughs> um, that kept the project uh, uh, away from its deadline. If you look at the Eurosund uh, bridge, it was basically because everybody had underestimated the complexity of building the thing, in particular, not the bridge itself. The bridge was actually easy. The bridge is just pouring lots of concrete. The actual problem was, how do you build the remaining connection through Copenhagen? Right, so that uh, overestimated that. In, with the Eurotunnel, the problem was, different again, it was safety concerns. Um, what happens if a train catches fire, which as you probably remember has actually happened. So yes, the projects look the same, they have the same characteristics, and yet if you look into them, into the details, you see lots of differences. I find that interesting. We find ourselves at a conundrum here. We want to evaluate, but if we do large N studies, which we like to do because then we can detect the patterns, we tend to lose the details. If we just look at the single cases, we see lots of details, but we have no idea how it relates to the whole. Um, and to me that matters a lot because um, it, all these projects take place in a certain environment, which means that they are sensitive for the contextual uh, details, right? I you just saw that, for example, in the Eurosund, where um, building the, the, the remaining part through the city was actually the, the, the main reason why things went wrong. So we have to find a method that deals with that. Um, 
and that is that is not just that is not just something that we do because we like it, sorts of kind of intellectual self-satisfaction. It's because it matters. Flubiak's study was influential. It led to policy changes in uh, Denmark, in the Netherlands, and um, perhaps even here in the UK. I'm not I'm not entirely certain, but at least in those two countries, it led to changes, right? So the better we are, the better we get at doing these policy evaluations, the better we can perhaps uh, influence uh, policies. But we ought to do that in a complexity sensitive way. Because if we don't do that, politicians and administrators will keep making the same mistakes. So how do you do that? Well, we carried out this, this study, as I mentioned, sponsored by Next Generation Infrastructures, where we looked at the reasons why projects uh, get you know, out of control. Um, uh, where, 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 where should I start? Well, it start actually with a reasoning. The reasoning is, well, what is the actual, the actual, you know, com uh, uh, on, on a very abstract level, what is the actual reason? Well, the actual reason is that all these projects take place in a context. So there's an interaction between the project and the context. So we need to look at that. The second thing is, not every interaction between the context and the project is a problem. For example, in some cases, and I will give you some details later on, it actually was beneficial. So rather than saying, well, we just focus on how interaction between context and project produces budget overruns, we looked at how this interaction was um, ultimately uh, um, assessed or valued. So we asked people, are you satisfied with the outcomes? Because in some cases, you may spend a lot more money, but if, the project, if that makes the project better and everybody agrees on that, then what's wrong with that? Right, so we asked people, are you satisfied with the outcome? Um, for this, we, we, we um, looked at a number of cases <coughs> where I have to emphasize that project is not a case. Because these mega projects are so big, they, they cover so many years that they're actually projects in themselves, they're programs of projects. Never mind that distinction. We treat every event, every event that can cause a disruption to the project as a case. That's the case. Right? So we want to know where did that event come from? What caused it? How did people respond to it? How did they manage that? And then finally, what, you know, did they like their response? You know? Did it work out the way they wanted it to work out? So that's what we, we asked them to do. And we asked uh, these managers working in these projects, 40 of them in total. Uh, by the way, that's very convenient. There are so, ma so few people who do these projects that you, in, when you do the interviews, you can talk just to a uh, you know, small set of people and you have covered a lot of stuff. So we asked them, you know, what happened? How did you deal with that? How satisfied are you with that? And then we try to reconstruct so this antecedent pattern and the outcomes uh, and see what happened. Then one, once we had mapped that all, we carried out the multi-value QCA uh, for the... Should, no, I'm not going to explain that. If you have questions about that, then you ask me later on. For now, just, uh, just accept the fact that we did a uh, multi-value QCA where we um, treated each event as a configuration of causes, outcomes, etc., etc., the, 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 the range I just mentioned, and where we compared um, the configurations, the, these configurations of contexts and projects um, that agree on the outcome but differ in one aspect. So we could identify which conditions were actually redundant in explaining uh, the, out, the actual outcome. And then, um, doing that, we identified five ways to the outcome, five pathways to the outcome. I'll explain them to you because it's interesting stuff. Um, first of all, we discovered that, you know, across the whole range, we figured out that approximately half of the time people were not satisfied with what they were doing, and, you know, in 20 cases they were actually satisfied. We're thinking actually of, of giving this, uh, the study a new title, which is 22 ways to screw up a project, but not entirely certain if that goes down very well, so let's see. So how did we get there? How did we get there? This is. We, we, we ought not to take a static view here. There's, there's no one variable that controls for this variety. There are pathways to that. Here they are. And I'll explain them to you. I'll explain them to you. So we discovered that we, have, we, uh, we mapped 42 disruptive events. And then we discovered that at least in two pathways, the nature of the event didn't matter. Right? So these are the top ones. And in some cases, it matters, actually. I'll talk you through it. So, uh, pathway A, here it is, pathway A, this is a very common one in these projects. This is the, pro this is the kind of project where uh, people um, start to complain, 
for example, about the fact that suddenly someone is building a tunnel in their backyard. That happens a lot. That is, that is, that's okay, you know, most people don't read the newspaper and see what's going to, going to happen and they start protesting the moment, you know, a, a drag line or whatever is coming along and removing the trees. One, one really cool example of this, if, if, if you may allow me that sidestep, Stuttgart 21 in Germany is where they spent 20 years planning the whole thing. That's, that's a long period and doing all these information stuff and everybody says, yeah, it's good for the city. Then they cut down the trees and that's where the, where the, where the shit hits the fan. Because that's where the people really uh, suddenly realized, wow, they're, they're really going to do it. You know, they're really going to do it. And then they started protesting and in a very German way they sent the police. <laughs> I can make that joke, right? Okay, so this is what happens. The social event takes place, and then what we see here is what we call an internal response. Doesn't matter who does it. Whether, the contract, whether it's the contractor or the public agency, doesn't matter. There's an internal response, and that said, aha, these people are protesting, you know what we'll do? We'll see them in court. So really, not, no, no any, uh, any outreach whatsoever, it's just saying, well, this is our procedure, this is the law, we, we can do what we want because we, you know, we've got law on our side, and so we continue. And there's a strong incentive to keep doing what you're doing because there's a deadline, there's a budget, there are people putting pressure on you. Interestingly, um, it doesn't lead to any satisfaction. People don't like that in the end. So while it, I mean, many projects have that logic, but ultimately it keeps lingering on. <laughs> in short, your context does not disappear if you ignore it, right? And that is something that you can see here. Um, the second pathway um, shows what happens a lot in public-private partnerships. That is the basically that independent of the nature of the event, independent of the nature of the event, if the private actor responds with an internal response, it doesn't lead to any satisfaction at all. So, uh, I'll give you one example. In this public-private partnership in uh, Rotterdam, the contractor had to come up with a technical solution. Um, he did that. And then uh, uh, the municipality said, no, we don't agree. You go back and do it again. So the contractor goes back, makes a new solution, no agreement. So, and that keeps lingering on for a long, long time. And what you can see here is what happens a lot in public-private partnerships, actually, is that, that the public agency believes that because they have paid a lot of money for the contract, they can sit, sit back and don't need to do anything. Well, we, we can show them, you know, that actually doesn't work. That really doesn't work. Um, so that is, that's a pathway that was also pretty common, but also didn't lead to any satisfaction. Now, the interesting thing is that on the base of pathway A and B, you would sort of assume that an internal response never leads to satisfaction, right? So outreach is the key. Not quite, because sometimes actually it does work, but only if the private actor takes the initiative. So sometimes this internal response does help in solving stuff, but it is the, the, uh, sorry, the public, it's the public, uh, the public actor who's got to do the response, not the private one. So this public actor who's got to do the response. You know why? Because for all their faults, public agencies on the whole are somewhat more sensitive for the, con the context than a contractor is. You know, builders, um, uh, builders want to build stuff. They don't care about the environment, uh, oh, un unless it's um, weak so ground conditions or anything. But they want to do stuff, right? So public agencies actually can solve it with an internal response. Um, in this pathway, it shows you that sometimes if they cooperate, an internal response can also work, but only in the case of a physical event. So like, like, like weak uh, ground conditions, that's one thing, or a problem with, the, with oh, know, steel ordered or something like that. In one project we looked into, it was really interesting, um, there was so much pressure on the public-private partnership, on the, on the whole concession actually, there was, there was so little time, the budget was so limited that the contractor had started ordering parts before the design had been made. So they were, they were taking a gamble here. Um, but they solved it together. Of course, the parts didn't work, right? So they were delivered and they didn't work. They were, uh, it, no, technical details, doesn't matter. Um, so, but, it, uh, but they solved it together and then ultimately they were still satisfied. The final one, the one that seems common sense but does not always happen, which is that you know, if you have social, uh, social disruption, an external a response, so that's going out, sitting down with people, talking, talking, trying to find compromises actually does work. It's tiring but it does, it does work. So here we are. Um, when it comes to the question of what leads to good projects, the answer is, well, at least five pathways, four or five pathways, right? 
There are five different ways, depending on ever so small details, whether it will work or not. So the devil is in the detail. And that's something that you can see if you do a single case study, you can see the details, but you don't see how it relates to the whole. If you do these large end studies, you don't see all these details. We talk to these people, you know, like an interview lasted between 90 minutes and two hours, just to see how they responded, how they valued that, and um, uh, why they responded in such ways. Details matter. Um, and so when it comes to doing a complexity informed evaluation, I cannot, I sincerely cannot go to a public agency and say, well, if you do this, you always have to be successful. No, not at all. But I can tell you, this is the range. So you have to scan your environment. You have to understand the interaction between the project and your context. And if you do that, and if you understand all these pathways, you may be uh, better able to achieve that. Um, so now we go into unknown territory. Um, I just said that, right? Yeah, I did, actually. <laughs> good, that's good, uh, given the, the, the time limits. W one thing I wanted to single out is this, this thing. I find out that among policymakers, but also among scientists, there is, there is um, a general fondness of symmetry. This leads to that, that leads to this. Um, or to say, well, um, this happened, but we didn't do this, so if we had done it, it would have happened. It doesn't make sense from an equifennel or a multifennel uh, point of view. And do we have time for that? Yeah, two, minutes. two minutes. So I have two minutes to talk about all these topics. So this is the slide that I put in without any plan. But what I wanted to show, what, one thing I wanted to say is that um, what, we, what we did here was still fairly static. Actually, it has some dyna dynamism because we, we have these steps, right, event, response, outcome, etc. But it's still fairly static. You can do much more. Uh, you can incorporate time even better than, than we did here. But again, I showed you only one example. The other thing I want to highlight here is that it all takes place in networks. So uh, if you ac actually to be, uh, to do this better, you should actually also add that aspect to it in a more um, coherent way. So these are the points, but we may come back to that later on, I guess, right? So that concludes my presentation. These are the uh, sources where you can find everything. Uh, the study is going to be published anytime soon. It has been accepted uh, two weeks ago. And there's some background reading too. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.